kick off, I would like to introduce my dash, who has, over the years, really <coughs> set the pace, not only uh, with research on the subject of Spoon or Jack, but fortune research in general. Uh, in the first, second, I think it was, one of the early fourteen studies, produced what was then the definitive Springfield Jack study. Since then, it's continued researches and come up with huge amounts more of uh, information from all over the world. We will shortly be um, publishing volumes edited, bringing together the latest research. But to give you a picture of where things stand now, that is with us today. Right, Ash. Um, I've got your sample of fifth at the back as well. Oh, so great. You can pick it up from the arse. Thank you. It's supposed to be my draw for the last couple of years. Okay, um, so Spring Hill Jack, um, as, as Ian says, this is a subject I've been studying for 26 years now. And um, I'm going to start where everyone always starts with Spring Hill Jack, which is a place called Bear Behind the Lane in Bow and the Allsop family on the evening of the 20th of February 1838. Um, you'll have to forgive me if you've already known part of this story. Um, one of the things that becomes clear about Springfield Jack as we go along is that there's essentially two things we need to think about. Firstly, there's the legend of Springfield Jack, the way in which the story is normally told in 14 books and anthologies. Uh, and secondly, there is the sort of historical reality behind that. And in order to discuss the latter, we need to sketch in the former. And most people do normally start with the attack on Jane Alsop, uh, an 18-year-old girl who was living with her father, um, no mention of any mother, uh, a sister and a brother, in a rather lonely house uh, in Bow in East London, which was at that time a semi-rural area. This is a, a map of the immediate location, Bear Behind the Lane is here. Um, if you look at the Bow Core book, um, it says that the Alsop residence was number one Bear Behind the Lane. I'm not sure if that means it's a house up here or this house here, but it would be one of the two. But either way, it's a fair distance away in what was then fields and countryside, uh, in an unlit pathway, um, no gas lights when we went up there. And at quarter to nine on this particular evening, there was a, a violent ringing at the bell of uh, number one bear behind the lane, and Jane Allsop went out uh, to open the door and find out what was going on. And what she found standing there was a tall, thin man with some sort of helmet or headgear, um, who said to her, for God's sake, bring a light, for we have caught spring Hill Jack here in the lane. Now, there had been a panic about the character spring Hill Jack going on in London for nearly two months at this point, and most Londoners knew uh, that uh, this demonic Superman uh, was supposedly loose around the metropolis. Um, spring Hill Jack, according to the legend, as Jane also would have heard it, um, was uh, an agile attacker of women, um, who would manifest himself in a number of different guises and disguises uh, and been sought actively by the authorities for six or eight weeks at this point. So Jane, being a good citizen, ran, ran back into the house and got a, a candle which she handed to the man at the gate and he then lifted it up to chest level uh, and uh, she could then see from the light of the candle shining up on his face that she had in fact encountered Spring Hill Jack himself. Uh, and she described the, uh, the monster that attacked her. Um, okay. She described the monster who attacked her as um, having blazing red eyes and um, claws instead of fingers. Um, he grabbed her, he uh, started clawing at her back, uh, he started tearing parts of her dress off and uh, grabbed at her hair as well. She screamed and tried to uh, extricate herself. Her screams attracted other members of her family. Uh, and eventually she and her sisters managed to wrest herself free. They uh, ran back into the house and slammed the door. And uh, spring Jack banged on the door for quite some time, shouting up at them. Until eventually they appeared at the upper window and called for the police. And he then made off. And uh, that story made its appearance in the newspapers two days later when the Alsop family appeared at uh, the local police office in Lambeth Street in East London um, and made a complaint uh, saying that this attack had happened. Um, a few days thereafter there was a second incident which is also fairly well known and it took place in a place called Green Dragon Alley which is also in East London uh, and it occurred um, at 8.30 on the 28th of February, so it's just over a week later 
and the uh, victim in this particular assault was a girl called Lucy Scales. Much less is known about this attack than the also attack, and the reason for that would appear to be that Lucy Scales was a working class girl and her brother was a butcher, whereas the also were comfortably middle class and therefore much more likely to be written about by the newspapers of the day. Um, but Lucy Scales had experienced something rather similar, Jane also. Um, if we try to find where, if you, sorry, I can't see what I want to do. Um, Fair Vine Lane is up here, and uh, Green Dragon Alley is just down here on the bend of the river. And uh, for the first time, I can show you a little bit more about where it really is. This is a map of London dating back to 1797. Uh, this is Narrow Street on the river. The rope walk, this is all uh, to do with servicing the ships that came to the port of London, and Green Dragon Alley is this thing here. And we're told in the newspapers that Spring Hill Jack was waiting at the corner of an angle in the alley, which I assume is this bit just here. That's the only likely place where he could have been waiting when uh, Lucy Scales and her sister, whose name we don't know, came walking through having uh, had some tea with her brother. And uh, when, he was, uh, when they approached him, Spring Hill Jack walked up to them, uh, breathed blue fire uh, into the face of Lucy Scales and left her in the stomach lying on the ground and then made swiftly off. Three days before that, although most of the um, secondary encounter we will say this is the third uh, encounter, there was also a rather obscure event in Turner Street, which is also in East London, um, just off Commercial Road, where um, a cabinet maker called Mr Ashworth had a house and there was a knock on his door at about 8pm on the 25th of February. His servant boy went to uh, open the door and uh, found himself confronting Spring Hill Jack. The servant boy, who had been alerted by the coverage of the Jane Orsall attack, realised fairly immediately what was happening and began to scream. <coughs> and uh, the uh, person who had materialised at his doorstep made off without any attempt to attack him. Um, a lot of accounts you'll see say that it's at this point that uh, the rather delightful detail that uh, a filigree W it was seen embroidered on Spring Hill Jack's cloak was. Uh, was observed. Uh, I'll come back to this later on, it's a, it's a fiction, but um, it's a fairly important bit of fiction because it applies, it, it has a lot to do with uh, how one tries to solve the mystery of who or what Spring Hill Jack might actually have been, and this is where this story comes from, uh, from one account in the morning hell a couple of days afterwards. So, th those are the three canonical, if one can use a Jack of it, um, canonical <coughs> Spring Hill Jack attacks in uh, 1838, but of course there's a lot more to the uh, the story than that, and many will be aware that some years afterwards, in 1877, there was a whole series of sightings of <coughs> Spring Hill Jack at the army base in Aldershot, which was the headquarters of the British Army, about 10,000 troops billeted there, uh, and over a period of two or three months in the spring of 1877, and then again in September 1877, um, Spring Hill Jack appeared at various outlying sentry posts, darted around in a fantastical fashion, scared the sentries witless and generally humiliated the uh, British Army. And then in 1904, what is generally regarded as the last sighting of Spring Hill Jack, took place on William Henry Street in Everton. Uh, and if you look at the secondary sources, they will tell you this was a particularly spectacular encounter where Spring Hill Jack leapt up and down William Henry Street with fantastic bands for a period of some minutes whilst being observed by several hundred people and then disappeared by leaping over the roof of one of the two-storey houses on that street giving a ringing laugh and vanishing forever, 66 years after his initial appearance. That then is a brief summary of the, the legend of Spring Hill Jack. And what I'm going to try and do with the rest of the talk is fill that out um, and try and sketch in a little bit more of what uh, actually happened uh, than is normally given in these sort of uh, sources. Uh, and all of this is based on, as Ian mentioned, the project I've been working on now for 26 years. Um, and which for the last five or six years I've been um, working on in conjunction with five other 14 scholars. Um, and in that time we've managed to accumulate now about 180,000 words worth of contemporary source material going uh, quite a long way back. 250 newspaper articles, extracts and books, etc. Et um, and just to give you some sense of what that means, when Peter Haining wrote the only book that's ever been published on the subject, up to the time I published mine at the end of this year, he had about 2,500 words of uh, source material that he based his book on, and that's one of the reasons why his book is so scandalously bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the, the scholars that I've uh, assembled to work on this project come from a variety of different disciplines. I myself uh, am a historian, 
Uh, I've got Dave Clark, who many of you will know, who of course is a uh, doctor of folklore. Uh, Paul Chambers, who is an expert genealogist, has been looking at, uh, into a number of the uh, uh, backgrounds of the early witnesses and names, and I'll come back to that later. And we've also recruited a guy called John Adcock from Edmonton in Canada, who's an expert on Victorian sensation journalism and Penny Dreadfuls. Um, and that's a very important aspect of this, um, which I haven't got time to go into in huge detail now, sadly. Um, but I'm particularly have been guilty, I think, over the years of neglecting the importance of looking at exactly how these things, uh, these reports, made their way into print in the first place. And John specialises in that, and he has um, pointed me, I think, the way towards what I now consider to be the solution to the mystery, which I will sketch in for you later on. So um, the book uh, that I'm producing and the work that I've been doing gives a much wider perspective on this mystery. We now have sources that appear to describe the same phenomenon that go right back to 1677. There's an almost uh, there's continuity, there are some fairly big gaps in the 18th century still at the moment, but I'm confident we'll fill them in eventually. Um, and as more and more sources now come online, digitization and online uh, research becomes much easier, we're finding a flood of new material coming in almost monthly, even now. Um, it's also given us a lot more information on 1838 and, and we understand the background of how this scare occurred and evolved far better than we did. Uh, and intriguingly, we now have comparable cases in uh, as many as 10 different countries and going right up to 2005. So this is not a phenomenon which is sort of isolated in aspect, which is um, uh, just a historical uh, curiosity. It's something which is still going on now. One of the things I want to touch on a bit later on in the talk is, is the reasons why Spring Hill Jack and the the phenomenon of sort of leaping agile assailants um, so rings a bell in people's psyche and unconscious. And hopefully also therefore we can finally touch on a solution as well. And I'll, I'll just move on as quickly as I can to, to start with that. Um, the origins and spread of the 1837 panic. Um, this is the first report. We, I'm pretty confident about this now. We've been researching 26 years, as I say, looking for where the first press mention comes. We've managed to track it back to the 28th of December. The Morning Chronicle, it's one of the main morning newspapers of the time. Um, and this uh, short paragraph appeared tacked on the end of another report which related to uh, gentle, young gentlemen, sort of drunken young gentlemen, uh, ringing doors and uh, smashing statues in Greenwich. And then at the end of that short report was this, um, reporting that uh, down in Lewisham, quite close to Greenwich, there was another panic going on involving the scandal of skies in the bearskin and wearing spring shoes. That was the original phrase that was used rather than spring yield. Um, and a number of the um, key motifs in the Spring Heel Jack story appear at this very early stage. We've got the spring shoes, we've got the uh, idea that the whole story is the, the uh, product of a wager between uh, aristocratic or gentlemanly people and it's uh, something which is ongoing because of a bet which is normally involves you know, scaring people or possibly scaring people to death even depending on the story you read. And then there's also this rather intriguing mention of the earliest version of the name, Steel Jack, which as we'll see but later on probably relates to the idea that the original Spring Heel Jack appeared clad in armour. Um, so that uh, takes us back uh, about 12 or 14 days earlier than the original sources that Peter Haining had and gives us some idea of how the uh, panic uh, involving Spring Hill Jack was boiling around in the outskirts of London uh, around about Christmas 1837. Um, and a second source, the West Kent Guardian, followed this up, and I think this is an important thing to mention because um, the central London newspapers got their material, as we'll come on to, from all sorts of uh, sources that were more or less unreliable. But uh, the West Kent Guardian was based in the same sort of area uh, that the attacks and the panics were actually happening, and the proprietor of that did his own little investigation when he read the story in the Morning Chronicle, he republished it and then appended this paragraph at the bottom of it a couple of days later. Um, so we have effectively two independent sources that do suggest that there was uh, a genuine some, uh, urban terror, panic or possibly real attacks going on um, in the southwest of London uh, at Christmas 1837. Uh, and the West Kent Garden identified Peckham, which is next door to Lewisham, as the uh, centre of this particular um, incident. So if we then go back, um, and we're using some slightly later sources that summarise what happened later, we, we find that most of the newspapers in January 1838 and thereafter uh, identified the beginnings of this phenomenon uh, as, as occurring around about September 1837 in the area in Barnes Common, which for those of you who don't know is the, um, the west of Barnes London, so the, the Greenwich and Lewisham of, of the east end of London. Uh, and Springfield Jack in those days appearing in the shape of a large white bull. 
Now, this is one of the, the weirder things about the entire story, was the number of different guises that uh, this place have appeared in in these early days. A large white bull in barns common, and then in each sheen in the form of a white bear. Uh, and then in Ham, Kingston, and Hampton, to the west of London again, had an armour of brass with spring shoes and claw gloves. Uh, and the idea that spring Jack had claws emerges at, therefore at that time in the autumn of 1837, when we heard how Jane also was attacked by a, uh, somebody who was wearing what appeared to be iron claws. Uh, then in Isleworth, uh, assaulting a carpenter dressed in polished steel armour with red shoes. And in Peckham, clad in the bearskin, this is one of the more dramatic versions, of which being drawn aside, exhibited a body in a suit of mail with a long horn. And, and so you're seeing there, in fact, the sort of combination of a number of these different motifs of the, the idea of being an animal um, a figure in armour or a demonic figure. And here you have two of those things put together, um, which there, there is a sort of conflation of the various different accounts. And what comes out of this, I think, is, is the most memorable version of Spring Hill Jack. Turns out to be the sort of demonic figure, the, the figure who has the emblem of the King of Hell. And, and this takes over from the earlier versions, um, and they fade in the background. So after January 1838, you're no longer reading about um, white bulls and white bears, although occasionally you get mention of, of figures clad in animal skins, uh, and the idea of Spring Hill Jack as a, essentially a demon figure um, emerges from that. There are still more um, reports in this early period. Um, an immense baboon, six feet high, with enormous eyes, um, who attacked a woman in Hammersmith, uh, Huntress, who fought back apparently and bested the baboon. In Hackney, and this is the most bizarre one, uh, this comes from a contemporary pamphlet which has been lost. One of the products of the research we've been doing is to rediscover some fragments of that, which is quite exciting. Um, and this is certainly the most surreal version of what Spiggy and Jack was a lamp light walking on his hands with a ladder between his feet. And finally, on the road to Woolwich, um, with blue flames, this is the first mention of the idea of fire breathing, um, it relates to the late autumn period of 1837, and attacking a girl. Um, and this time dressed as a gentleman, but with a white sort of scarlet down the back of his coat. And uh, again, the, the agility is beginning to be, it doesn't appear in the very first case, but the agility which gives Spring Hill Jack his name is starting to emerge at this point as well, because being pursued, he sprang over the fences as usual, and was out of sight in an instant. So that's, if you've been living in the, the around the aspects of London in 1837-1838, those are the sort of rumours that you might have heard up to the 8th of January 19, uh, 1838, which is when the next very important incident occurred. So John Cowan, who was the Lord Mayor of London, um, held a weekly session at the Mansion House, uh, where he dealt with um, public inquiries and public complaints. Uh, and on this particular um, week, he had a number of anonymous letters, the most important of which was simply signed a resident of Peckham, and, and all of which complained about uh, the attacks that Spring Hill Jack was <coughs> in the area and asked the Lord Mayor to do something about it. Um, and this is an extract from the letter written by the resident of Peckham. And again, you'll see that this sets out and in fairly clear terms um, the rumour that allegedly was going around at the time that the whole thing was the work of a gang of uh, wild aristocrats who laid a wager that uh, the person who'd taken the bet would not appear. As many villages around London as you could in three disguises, a ghost, a bear, and a devil. That's a very familiar phrase in Spring Hill Jack studies. Um, and alarm the inmates of various houses. And that uh, this was an ongoing problem and therefore was going to continue to occur until the terms of the wager had been fulfilled and the right number of people had ever apparently been scared witness. Uh, and the Lord Mayor's response to this, which was broadly to say that he thought it was a load of rubbish, but uh, would try to look into it, uh, was reported in the Times on the 10th of January and then um, picked up from there by a huge number of papers. You can find that report probably in 30 or 40 uh, newspapers, not just in London, but around the country um, in January 1838. Uh, and from there it passed very rapidly into popular folklore. It was immediately taken up by the satirical journals in London, of which there were at least four or five with quite large circulations, who immediately identified Spring Hill Jack as the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, whatever <laughs> they had at that time. You can imagine who'd be picked on these days. Uh, and within a matter of a month or so, you started seeing the first imitators appear. Um, we found three or four of them so far of varying degrees of incompetence. Daniel Granville in Kentish Town was probably the most interesting because he had uh, arranged some sort of um, cotton wool type substance around his mouth to resemble Spring Hill Jack's fire. But there were a number, I mean, the, the point to make about those people really is that they were 
um, very poor imitations. They, they were fairly rapidly apprehended. The police had no problem rounding them up. The people they attacked weren't particularly scared by them. There seems to be a, a definite disconnect between the imitators and what we might term, with heavy inverted commas, the real Spring Hill Jack. Uh, and at the same time, the newspapers also started to expand and extend and, and um, clarify the various explanations, which by far the most popular was the idea that this whole thing was um, a bet between various aristocrats. Uh, and here, a yeah, day after the Lord Mayor um, uh, had his letters, the Times was already reporting that the whole thing was a lot more serious than had originally been stated, and in fact it involved effectively murder. Now it's important to say that we had no actual cases of people genuinely dying as a result of this, but this was the story rolling on and escalating, very much as uh, Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross must be feeling at the moment. <laughs> um, so if we try to get a feel of what actually happened, uh, and starting with the Jane Austen uh, account, we're going to have to rush through this a bit, we'll never get through all this, I'm sorry about that, this, but so we'll take some questions later maybe. Um, first of all, it's important to say that as far as Jane Austen is concerned, and Jane, Jane Austen was a real person who made a real complaint at the police court uh, at Lambert Street, um, something quite frightening and quite bizarre did in fact happen. <coughs> this is the account she gave to the Lambert Street magistrates. Um, that uh, the person who attacked her had vomited forth a quantity of blue and white flames from his mouth, that he had eyes that resembled balls of fire. I mean, it's important to remember he was holding a candle at sort of chest height and shining up, which was, that has contributed something to this effect, um, rather than the idea that his, his eyes only had sort of an independent source of light from, from inside in some way. Um, and was wearing this bizarre costume with a large helmet and a white, tight, oil skin dress. Um, and that he attacked her quite seriously and commenced tearing again his claws, which she thought were of a metallic substance. And this is from the iconic report in the Times, the 22nd of February, which is uh, the one you'll see reprinted or excerpted in a large number of anthologies and <coughs> books. Um, however, we can take that quite a few steps further, in fact, because as a result of the work done by the Springfield Jack Project, we've now found a number of um, much more extensive investigations that were. Um, carried out because as a result of Jane Austen making this complaint, uh, the magistrates at Lambeth Street appointed their own police officers to look into the case. Now, this was at a very early stage in the development of policing in London. The Metropolitan Police had only been founded about 10 years earlier, uh, and although it did have a presence in Stepney, which is the nearest police headquarters to Jane Austen, uh, the magistrates of the various police courts around London had their own investigating officers who they were able to use to um, in uh, order to investigate particular cases that came before them. And in the case of the uh, Lambert Street office, um, there was a man uh, who we'll come back to in a minute again called James Lee, who was one of the best known detectives in London at that period. So there were two investigations going on into the Austin account, one by Lee and one by the uh, Metropolitan Police. Inspector Young of the Stepney Division was looking into it as well. And so quite a lot of work was done yeah, in the Bow area to try and find out what was behind this, what was come up with, uh, and whether any culprits could be found. Now the first thing to stress about this is that although Jane Allsop made this very dramatic report saying that she had fire breathing in her face and been severely um, belaboured by a man wearing some sort of claws, so there were actually no burns or severe cuts or scratches at all visible in court. Um, and one of the witnesses who uh, Lee turned up, who had been in Bear Bind Lane on the evening question, only a few hundred yards from the Allsop's door, and who um, saw Jane Austen immediately after the, account, uh, the attack when she screamed and he ran to her help, a man called Richardson, he told the court on the 2nd of March um, that he was under the impression that the attack had not been anywhere near as furious as he saw it described in the newspapers. Um, Spring Hill Jack had not leapt or bounded away, as you might read in many of the secondary sources, he'd escaped by, quote, and this is an exact quote, scampering away across the fields. Um, and the balls of fire that Jane Allsop described plainly weren't very dramatic because Richardson and his friend Smith were interrogated on this point by the <coughs> Lambert magistrate, Mr. Hardwick, and they were both absolutely insistent that although they'd been only 100 to 120 yards away at the time of the attack, that uh, they'd not seen any blue and white balls of fire, and had they been uh, as dramatic as Jane Allsop described them, that they must have seen these things because there was a clear line of sight <coughs> between them and the garden gate where she was attacked. Um, and this was explained to me um, a while ago um, by Otto Black of uh, ASAP in Edinburgh, um, who, who sent me a letter to say that at this time a number of magicians produced um, the effect of flames in their mouths by putting a small ball of cotton wool or a uh, sponge of some sort into their mouth, which was impregnated with some sort of alcohol, and by then breathing out um, 
uh, onto a, a lit candle or lantern, you could produce a very localised ball of fire, which was quite dramatic close up within a matter of a, feet or a few feet. It was almost invisible uh, anywhere further away than a few feet away. And, and my suspicion is that this is exactly what Jane also saw, and that somebody had used this relatively well-known early Victorian conjuring technique to produce the balls of fire that she saw, because certainly they weren't a sort of a huge volcano of blue and white flames, which is the impression one tends to get from reading the, the accounts that uh, are often published in Fortune anthologies by people who have not actually researched this particular case. Now this is James Lee, the detective. As I say, he was one of the best known and most successful detectives in London at this time. Um, he was most famous for having arrested uh, the murder of Mariah Martin, who was the, the Red Barn victim, which is one of the most notorious murder cases in Britain in the first third of the 19th century. So he was a very well-known, very special detective. And he did his own investigation. And he identified two suspects who had been in Bearbind Lane that evening, named Payne and Milbank. Milbank was the person he particularly suspected of having carried out the attack. Um, and uh, Milbank was a carpenter who had been dressed on that evening in a white fustian jacket and white hat. Now you remember that Jane also described her attacker as having a white, uh, as having a helmet of some sort and a tight white outfit. Um, one of the other people who uh, Lee found, Richardson, who we've already mentioned, um, met somebody in the, in the lane just after the attack, who said jokingly that there was the Spring Hill Jack was about, and thought seemed to think the whole thing was a very much a laughing matter. And then um, a few minutes later, Richardson's friend Smith um, saw the same two men who he'd met in Bearbinder's Lane, um, and they were talking to each other, and he overheard them. This was Payne and Milbank, the Paynes, as the Times later has it. Uh, and their conversation was really fairly incriminating. It was rascally, I would not have done it on any account, Payne said to Milbank. Um, and then immediately afterwards said, What have you to say to Spring Jack when he saw Richardson looking at them? So, as far as Richardson was concerned, this was an admission that Payne and Milbank had actually put, um, participated in this attack uh, and they were the people responsible for attacking Jane Olson. Um, <coughs> If we look then briefly again at what happened in the Green Dragon Alley and the Lucy Scales attack, less easy to know because there were fewer, fewer witnesses. But um, Lucy Scales' description was fairly similar to Jane Allsop's. Her assailant was tall and thin, wore a headdress, not resembling a space helmet or anything like that you might read, but a bonnet. Uh, carried a large bullseye on that, which of course is quite important because in the Allsop uh, account, if you think back, um, Spring Hill Jack actually waited for Jane Olson to produce a candle before he breathed fire in her face and one might, I think, logically conclude that he needed the candle in order to set fire to whatever flames or um, uh, flammable liquid he might have had about his person. Um, and similarly here, Spring Hill Jack came equipped with his own flame uh, and he was holding it at uh, chest height. He, he was wearing the same sort of broad cloak and he spread a blue flame, which of course is a characteristic of alcoholic based liquids. Um, into her face. There were no independent witnesses to this account of course, because it happened in, a, in an alleyway, not on a fairly well frequented country path. The only other person who was there was um, Lucy Scales' unnamed sister, who spent most of her time trying to um, look after her sister rather than worrying about exactly what was happening to them. Um, but the Scales family did call a surgeon immediately afterwards who testified that uh, the victim was frightened and hysterical. Again, the surgeon said no bones or any other injuries on Lucy Scales, um, and the attacks are not um, hugely serious from a purely physical point of view. This is a very interesting um, detail, which is very underreported in my opinion. Um, Lucy Scales' brother testified that just a few minutes before the attack, um, his sister had been reading an account of the Alsop attack. <coughs> Plainly, one could legitimately say that she had this uh, attack on Jane Alsop in her mind, and this may well have contributed to the amount of fear and the amount of panic that she felt when whatever happened to her in Green Dome Alley did occur. So, just confining ourselves to the 1837-1838 panic, there were essentially three potential solutions therefore that we have to the mystery. The first is the investigation that Lee and the uh, police from Stepney uh, did, and they identified Milbank as the most likely suspect. Um, in his favour, in terms of him being Spring Hill Jack, he was in the right area, we know he was in there by the lane at the time of the attack, he was dressed in white, um, he behaved pretty suspiciously, he wouldn't testify to all he knew about uh, what he'd been doing on that evening, and at least some of the witnesses, uh, Richardson and Smith, identified him as the uh, most likely assailant and gave some very incriminating statements regarding what he'd said. Um, we know that Norbank knew the Allsop family, and one of the things that happened 
um, when Spring Hill Jack knocked on the door was that he asked for the old stop so plainly he knew the family, knew the area fairly well. Uh, and he was too drunk to remember what he'd done. Well, that was the story he gave to the magistrates at Lambert Street as well. Against Milbank is the fact that the Allsop family en masse were convinced that their attacker was not drunk. Um, and if anybody was playing around with fire breathing apparatus, being drunk would not be a very sensible thing to be at the fire. Um, also, um, if you assume, and it is a very broad leap, and I don't necessarily think that you can make this leap, but if you assume that the person responsible for the Allsop and Scales attack was the same person who'd been spreading panic around about London in that period, you have to ask yourself whether um, a carpenter who, who almost certainly would not have owned a horse or a carriage and there was no public transportation really in London at that time would have been able to get to all these places in West London like Hammersmith, Miserworth and Hampton. Um, and if he had, why he would then go to the ludicrous risk of then attacking a girl practically on his own doorstep. So all those factors mitigate against the idea that Millbank was in fact Spring Hill Jack in my opinion. Um, the second suspect, the most popular one today, and the person who Peter Haney in his book identified as the most likely um, perpetrator, was the Marquis of Waterford. He was the great, um, <coughs> infamous uh, young blood of the time, a dissolute aristocrat, well known for uh, his drunken frolics, um, for making attacks on people he got himself in trouble in the world, in Melton Mowbray, where he painted the town red, quite literally, during a race meeting. Um, and only a few months earlier in Bergen in Norway where he had been um, molesting a, a servant girl there when he was caught by the local um, street uh, constable and hit over the morning star and nearly killed. And uh, it took a, a couple of months in fact to recover from that attack. And also in uh, Limmer's Hotel which is a famous sporting uh, meeting place, place for young bloods at that time where around that this period he fought a duel um, with another um, Reverend called Lindsay over a very minor argument. So he was a sort of person who could well have been responsible for this sort of perpetration. Um, Hayne describes him as being a bug eyed nobleman who had been incapacitated with eye problems. Um, this is a little line in Times in November 1837, which Hayne suggests might have been caused by his fire breathing exploits having inflamed his eyes. Um, and Hayne also reports um, from the privately published memoirs of one of Mar the Marcus of Waterford's friends, Sir Frederick Johnston. That um, on their return from the incident in Bergen, um, during which um, Waterford had allegedly acquired a significant <coughs> hatred of certain girls and women in general as a result of his treatment there, um, his spirits were raised by talk of a, a wager to be um, in, indulged in on their return to London, which is um, an interesting comment, if true. I'll come back to that as well in a moment. Um, so, if we look at the idea of whether an aristocratic wager could have been responsible for the 1837 8 panic, the behaviour that Spring Hill Jack was described as exhibiting was certainly not atypical of Waterford. He was capable of that sort of level of violence. Um, and he was apparently in London or around London for the duration of the pact, as far as we can tell. Um, unlike Milbank, he certainly possessed the necessary resources. He had the um, wherewithal to travel about town. He obviously would have enough to possess horses and carriages and servants to help him do so. And plainly would have had enough money to assemble the costumes all these costly suits of armour and bearskins and so on, um, which would have been required if all of the stories of the, uh, the autumn period were literally true, which is not necessarily the <coughs> case. Uh, he also had friends to provide him with support, and we know that at least two people were involved in the Olson case because Spring Hill Jack uh, threw down his cloak at the moment of attacking Jane Olson and didn't retrieve it when he scampered off, but by the time the police arrived, the cloak had vanished, so somebody retrieved the cloak for him, and therefore at least two people were involved which might well tie in with the idea of um, a wager in which various aristocrats were egging each other on to ever more violent excesses. And from really even in 1838, it was fairly clear that a number of the people writing about this in the press suspected that Waterford was responsible. Uh, now, for the last 20 odd years, I've been looking as hard as I can for any sort of smoking gun that might give us more than that vague suspicion. And I'm pleased to say that I have actually found something. Um, it's not ideal because it dates to a much later date. It dates to 1903 and it comes from a Macmillan's magazine article about Limmer's Hotel, which is by a guy called Gerald Brennan. But Brennan did um, state in this article that he'd interviewed people who'd been servants at the hotel in the 1830s, and by 1903 they'd have been about 80, 85, so it's not impossible that this is the case. And this is what um, Brennan reported in Macmillan's magazine in December 1903. Firstly, that Waterford had the habit of dressing up as the devil with horn, hooves and tail complete and then pulling over the brimstone and leaking out of people. And secondly, that the servants at Limmers 
actually found a disguise and accessories uh, such as the terror of Middlesex, that spring heel jack, might have used in the Mad Lord's room on the second floor when he left um, in that spring. Now, if true, that is the smoking gun you'll be looking for. Um, it's impossible to know, really. Brennan could well have been speaking to people he knew what they were talking about. Equally, over a period of 60 years, the stories could well have become embroidered or simply been invented. So you can't say that's definitive proof, but that is probably as close as we're going to get to um, any sort of evidence that the Marcus of Water was formally involved in the Swing Hill Jack Panic. I was quite pleased when I turned that up on the set. Um, the, uh, the negatives with regard to the aristocratic wage theory are as follows. Firstly, as we mentioned just now, um, it appeared that the person who attacked Jane Alsop was known to the Alsop family. There's no reason whatsoever to assume that the Marcus of Waterford would have been acquainted with a minor middle class family in the extreme east end of London. Um, secondly, he doesn't match the identification given by the two witnesses in Bearby and the Lane, Smith and Richardson. And thirdly, the, the um, points that Peter Haney in his book used to suggest that Waterford was the attacker, principally the idea that there was a W employed on Springfield Jack's clothes in the Turner Street attack. And these memoirs of Frederick Johnson, where he mentions the idea of a wager being proposed on the return from Norway. Both of these are actually hoaxes. Firstly, there's, there's only one very short newspaper account which refers to the Turn Street attack, and there's no mention of any filigree embroidery on any clothes in that. Haney has apparently just made that up. And Sir Frederick Johnson, who Haney describes as looking back in old age on his, his misspent youth and, and writing about this wager, Sir Frederick Johnson died in a fall from his horse in 1841 at the age of 30. So he certainly didn't live long enough to pen any memoirs. And the reference which Haney gives to the memoirs and correspondence of Sir Frederick Johnson cannot be found in any library catalogue I've consulted, and believe me, I've consulted a very large number. This book does not exist, and the entire thing has simply been made up by Haney to support his theory that Waterford was responsible for the attacks. Uh, all of which then leads us on to a possible third solution, and the idea that the entire panic, or at least a large part of it, was in fact some sort of urban legend or moral panic in, in uh, London at this time. And that explanation does fit most of the known facts. Um, folklorists use the term ostension to describe how people act out folklore that they've heard and it becomes effectively real. So it doesn't, you don't have to argue that no physical attacks actually happen, that the entire thing was merely a piece of hysteria invention that Jane also either made it all up or maybe even didn't exist. Um, and Lucy Scales' is hysteria um, also suggests that of course she may not have been an entirely reliable witness as we've already seen. Um, and there are some uh, mentions in the press at the time, which I've managed to turn up, which do quite heavily support the idea that some sort of urban legend or modern uh, folklore was, was uh, involved. Firstly, the Morning Herald sent a reporter out to West London when the castle first exploded, and he questioned people, and really you could hardly write a better description of a, a sort of Harold Brunvang side of urban legend <coughs> and how it propagates itself and what the Morning Herald published on the 10th of January, with the reporter going from person to person, each of them had been told He'd been told, knew something about the story, and each time he speaks to somebody, they'd say, well, I don't know anything about it, but I can put you point towards somebody who did. And he also questioned the police in the area who would made their own inquiries and also could not find a single person who actually uh, had any personal experience. They merely thought everybody had just heard the rumours that were going around. The West Kent Guardian, one of my favourite sources, I'm very keen on this paper, because it has a lot of independent good stuff, <coughs> had done its own investigation again, uh, and they were also convinced that the entire story was a gross piece of humbug and described in very similar um, terms uh, to what the hell had found in West London, what had been going on in East London at the same time, where stories had got wilder and wilder and ended up with people talking about Springfield Jack hopping over quite a wide canal, for example. But again, the same exact um, species of evidence in that no, nobody can be found who will actually admit to having personally had any experience of a spring or jack sighting or attack of any sort. So, um, and I stress this is really just choking in the absolute sort of top end of, of the evidence we've got. I could discuss this for quite a lot longer than I've got. We can work very briefly towards a solution of just the 1837 8 panic. I can't really use that one. Jesus Christ. Okay, um, I'm really happy to go far too far. Firstly, contemporary newspaper coverage is. Um, there was no, nothing in the contemporary press at that time suggests in any way anybody ever considered that there was anything supernatural or paranormal about Spring Hill Jack. Secondly, there's no belief that there's only one Spring Hill Jack in the Victorian period. This is something which you read time and time again in the anthologies of the period. Um, 
that there must be something supernatural about it because he appeared in 1838 and he appeared in 1904 and it's the same thing and no, no one person could have done that. Uh, there are many, many Spring Hill Jacks in the Victorian period. There are descriptions of there being so many of these Spring Hill Jacks about, by which people meant agile thieves, um, elusive burglars, pranksters, sexual assailants. And of course, at the same time, we've also got the, the story being propagated time and time again by being told as a cautionary tale of nurseries as a way of scaring people. And also, uh, uh, Spring Hill Jack appeared in a number of Penny Dreadful serials um, from the 1860s uh, as a villain, which helped to propagate the name and remind people. And there is no first-hand evidence really whatsoever of um, any of the supernatural attributes which one reads about Spring Hill Jack, and particularly the preternatural leaping ability he supposedly exhibited. Um, Elizabeth Villiers, who interviewed a witness to uh, a Spring Hill Jack appearance um, on Tooting Beck Common, um, this was published in the 1920s, uh, and her witness described him as doing far more than an ordinary man could have accomplished, but nothing resembling the exploits he'd been credited by rumour. Uh, and similarly we have um, one of my favourite discoveries from a theatrical family, Edward Southern, who was living in Kensington in 1870 when a number of small robberies occurred in the area and rumours went around that uh, Spring Hill Jack was responsible for the robberies and was leaping off over these ten foot high walls and when he was finally caught it turned out he'd been clambering or even crawling over the walls and the uh, thief in question had no, little or no agility. That's just one case and one of the very few examples where the thief in question was actually caught. One could easily imagine how that explanation might well have applied in, in similar cases where nobody was actually caught. This is the cover of one of the examples. You can see the sort of way in which String of Jack was portrayed as a demonic and a superhero type figure. I'm not going to have time to go into these, unfortunately, because of the way the time is going. But um, all, all of the, uh, the other cases you see here, Polly Adams and Maria Davis, these are inventions of Peter Haney again, which he managed to track down um, over the over the years uh, and show that his accounts are uh, fictional. And these are the, the more dramatic stories. Maria Davis in particular, who was a prostitute allegedly murdered by Spring Hill Jack um, on Jacob's Island in 1845, where she was thrown into a muddy ditch and drowned. Um, there's no Maria Davis or Mary Davis or Marie Davis um, in the death records um, in London at that time. Um, and Haney's account of the lanky man um, who leapt over donkeys on Spring Hill, in Spring Hill boots in Worcester uh, in, 18, in the 1870s is similarly a hoax. So I haven't time to go into why, but uh, I can answer questions about that if anyone's interested. And uh, finally, the ringing laugh, which you remember me mentioning, um, Spring Hill Jack departing from Liverpool. With, um, was something which was never mentioned in any of the uh, press accounts, but which comes very firmly from the Penny Dreadfuls where it's one of these dramatic devices the authors of Penny Dreadfuls <coughs> use repeatedly, um, and which only appears in fictional versions. Okay, I'm going to have to whiz through these, unfortunately, but we have now, in fact, got, a, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a very um, strong line of, uh, of uh, similar sorts of stories, which date right back to a pamphlet published in 1677, involving um, an alleged pact with the devil, um, which some local ne'er-do-well had, had uh, sealed, and which gave, in which the devil supposedly gave this man uh, leave to do what he pleased for the space of three years without any danger of being captured. And this pamphlet published in, uh, in the reign of um, Charles II, um, mentioned amongst other things that uh, the person who had sealed this pact with the devil was given supernatural agility which allowed him to leap over brick walls 10 or 15 feet high. That's the earliest we've managed to track this um, spring heels uh, motif back to, although I wouldn't mind betting it probably goes back before that. Um, similarly, the Hammersmith ghost who appeared in 1804 was described by the Star uh, in January 1804 as breathing fire and smoke and by the, um, in proceedings of the Old Bailey, because there was actually a murder case which revolved on the particular scare. Uh, as being dressed in calfskin, dressed with horns on his head and glass eyes, quite reminiscent of Spring Hill Jack. So that's 1804. In 1809, in Croydon, you have the man with the curry comb who's attacking women and curry combing their forms divine, as the, uh, as the Woolwich Gazette put it. Uh, and he is described as a, a man wearing a black mask, military boots with long spurs, and again, making off and leaping over park palings and walls of extraordinary height with the great seas. Again in 1824 you have the new Hammersmith ghost, note that this is the same area that the Spring Hill Jack legend of 1837-8 appears, who um, had glaring eyeballs and f emitted flame, was, was impossible to catch, and had hooked in instruments fastened onto the end of his finger. 
So, um, pretty much an exact description of Spring Heel Jack, 1837 is uh, appearing in the London Press as early as January 1824. Uh, and that scare went on into 1825, where the motif of a nobleman's son who is involved <coughs> in a wager also appeared. So, these stories were, going, were doing the rounds 13 years before the uh, Spring Heel Jack, which we all know about. Again, in the Isle of Wight, uh, only a year later, there was a ghost reported in the Glasgow Herald who'd been frightening people into fits um, and was found to be invulnerable because he was wearing spring, uh, steel armour and wearing spring boots and vaulting over ten feet walls. Uh, and again, a house of monster this time was described in the County Herald in 1833, so this is another nine years further on. And again, the, the description is almost exactly what you would expect to find in the Spring Hill Jack case in 1837 1838 scaling walls and hedges, dressed in armour, and carrying out a wager. But what does all that mean? Does this mean that, that we actually have got some sort of demonic alien leaking around Britain for a period of 200 years? Uh, not really. Um, again, I'm not going to be able to go into this in huge detail, but as I mentioned earlier, that the key to understanding this is understanding Victorian journalism, and particularly the national papers who had small staff and most of the political reporting, and the local papers basically had one man operation. None of them had the resources to report these sort of stories. They got their information from a uh, contemporary freelance journalist called Penny Alliance. Um, they traded on sensation, fires, murders, freaks and outrages. And they could supply a number of different newspapers by this wonderful device of the flimsy, which is a sort of early carbon paper, if anyone remembers carbon paper, where you could um, make up to eight different copies of your handwritten report and hand them in at all the various newspaper offices in the hope of getting more than one to print your story and you got paid. As, as the name implies, a penny a line for each report in each newspaper. And in order to make a living, these people, uh, we know, uh, were more than happy to invent or recycle stories. And plainly, this does bring to mind the idea, uh, what we were just talking about, the, the way in which the story, the, the motifs of Spring of that reappear time and time again over the period from 1804 up to 1833, and then again in 1837, 1838. It's entirely possible that some of these cases are being recycled by ambitious freelance journalists who haven't got a story, need to make some money to eat and recall um, earlier incidents and simply rewrite them, changing a few details. Um, there are known instances of this type of thing happening. Sweeney's Hodge is quite a good example as well, where uh, the stories began in France in 1615, 1616, um, was transplanted to London by these types of um, uh, three <coughs> um, And some of the indicators in 1837 8 are quite, um, give a very firm impression this is what was going on. Um, all of the scares that we went through happened at times when Parliament were in recess. There was no major murder sensation going on in London um, in the early uh, months of 1838. The next major one would be the murder of Eliza Grimmer, which was some months off. The anonymous letters to the Lord Mayor, which were written very much in the same sort of purple prose that Penny Alinus were wanting to use as well. And Key, one of my um, contributors to the um, Springfield Jack Project, Paul Chambers, has uh, used his genealogical skills to try and trace the witnesses who are mentioned in the press accounts dating up to the Jane Austen account. And he has shown um, by using the censuses, local street directors and so on, that well over two thirds of all the people mentioned in the press up to uh, February 1838 didn't exist, which obviously is a heavy indicator that they were really invented by um, contemporary journalists. And we have one known instance of this where a guy called Henry Shane Solly, who ended up as a professor of English uh, at King's College London, admitted in the 1890s to having sent a poach report to a Sunday newspaper uh, in which he simply made up some stories about Spring Hill Jack and had been very gratified that it appeared. And uh, there is, in fact, um, a report in The Observer, which was a Sunday newspaper, of course, at that time, uh, which appears to be the one that he's talking about. Uh, I'm going to go through this even faster than the last few pages. Um, the, second, the second major um, discovery that we've made in the course of the Springfield Jack project is that these stories don't just exist, um, in, <coughs> and certainly not just in London, 1837-8, uh, and they can be found very widely. Um, in Britain, all the way from Ab Aberdeen is the furthest north, we've got Guernsey is the furthest south, and Port Maddow uh, all the way across to Great Yarmouth. There are about 50 or 60 different cases, <coughs> many of which are just um, local practices or um, folks who are given the uh, appellation Spring Hill Jack because it's the way you described them in those days. But also the same stories appear um, wherever um, Britain has an empire and you can see them being spread by the export of um, Penny Dreadfuls for one, one thing. Anchi Summers uh, in, in South Africa had prodigious leaps 
and wind peels. There were four separate scares in New Zealand, and one in the Melbourne area in Australia in 1895, <coughs> and in Newfoundland, uh, Spring Hill Jackson, uh, a fairly obvious um, copy of Spring Hill Jack, who was described as having springs in his shoes uh, and was used to terrify local children into behaving. Rather more weirdly, there were also similar cases from places that Britain had no obvious cultural connections with at all. And this is probably the most bizarre one we discovered today. It dates to the Russian Revolution of 1917, where according to Alexei Tolstoy, and this is a novel that he's writing as though the people who are reading this in Russia, it's a Russian novel, you know what he's talking about. And apparently there was a rumour going around at the time of the Russian Revolution of leapers with special springs on their feet who held Petrograd, that's St. Petersburg to you. Um, in fear and who attacked uh, one of the characters in his book and then disappeared in long leaps over the Swan Bridge. We're trying to find more information on that now. I'm going to have to stop any second. Uh, Province town in the United States, which I mentioned in my Spring Hill Jack paper, uh, and Prague, where this rather wonderful character, Parak, the Spring Man, appeared, and uh, one of the contributors to the book, uh, Petra Janicek, who's a professor of ethnology at Charles University, has been investigating this and has gathered 20 or 30 different accounts. Um, and how the Spring Hill Jack legend got to the Czech Republic in the Second World War, I, at the moment, I can't answer that question. Uh, and finally, Argentina in, uh, in uh, actually I should say 2006, I don't know why it says 1986, that must have been And Somalia, this is the most, uh, probably the, another very uh, unusual place, although Somaliland was a British protectorate, I can't really imagine how British culture could have penetrated the local people, but there was a panic there in, in 1985, which Alex Murdy will be appearing on the panel with me this afternoon, probably describing more detail. So we'd be glad to get to the conclusions at this point. Firstly, it's a story that has to be seen in context and not in isolation. Um, you have to understand British folklore and the continuity of British folklore and Victorian journalism to understand Springfield Jack. Um, you have to wipe out Peter Payne and his hoaxes. I've spent weeks of my life doing so. I'm, I must say, it, it annoys me that people put these in circulation. It's very difficult to disprove a negative, and a lot of work was required. Um, and it's a story which is still being told today. It's, it's not a, a piece of, of history, but a, it's a living, breathing um, legend of, uh, which, which is continuing to be reported around the world today. And even last week, when I, I, I met somebody who said they heard a similar story only a few years ago in Copenhagen. And they got, I'm going to try and find out more about that, of course. So, uh, of all folklore figures, Spring Hill Jack probably has more potency and longevity than, than almost any other uh, figure one can, can think of. And the reason for that, I think, is the reason why I personally got interested in the subject in the first place, which is this is a, a story with the power to terrify. And I remember very vividly reading about Spring Hill Jack in my World of Wonder magazine when I was 11 and being terrified by the idea that he was still around and might. Uh, Agilely leap up into my second floor bedroom window and uh, tap on the window while I was asleep. And that's the sort of reason why I think that the, the, uh, the figure of Springfield Jack has the power that he exhibits over all of our minds and has sustained such an amazing and lengthy history. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry I watched that last bit, but that summarizes very briefly our discovery. So I've got time for half a question, maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much.